بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم اولا به تمام دوستا سلام عرض میکنم دومی از خداوند متعال تقاضا دارم که خود شما فامیلای شما دوستای شما همه سهتمند باشین و زی امراض های کرونا وایرس و بقی امراض دور باشین سیومی گپی است که کورس لیبر ریلیشنز این کلکتیف بارگنیر از خانه برتان نشر کنیم بازم خوش آمده به شهر ما شهر فولواردل فلوریدا نزدیک میامی استم Hello everybody, welcome to Labor Relations and Collective Bargaining class. It's a fun class, interesting class. You can apply it both in a public sector as well as in private sector organizations. So regardless of where you work, chances are some of the concepts and practice that we talk about, you can apply to your workplace. And hopefully if you're a manager, you can provide a better work environment for your employees. And if you are an employee, hopefully you can work out a good deal with your managers to make the organization a better place, both for your clients and customers, but also for yourself and your colleagues in every single department institution. So since we're living in the era of coronavirus, which is basically closing all universities and offices and businesses, now we have to do all these lectures through online mediums and online platforms, as you can see here. Uh, with this class. So welcome to my house here in Fort Lauderdale of Florida and we'll continue the lectures. Come on in. Bien, bajar la jona, la chara y dama meten. Mira por ahí, los con el bien, peixa, bien, 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 bien. Josh Amadin, mira por ahí, con el los con el bien, 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 bien. Welcome to Labor Relations and Collective Bargaining course. Again, I am Dr. Bahaudin Mushtaba, and it's my pleasure to be facilitating and teaching this class with you at the master's program. Okay, before we move on, so let's take a look at the general format and requirements of this class. In other words, looking at your course syllabus. We can take a look at your syllabus. So if you have a printed version of your syllabus, go ahead and pull it out so we can look at it together. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at your course syllabus. Again, the name of the class is PUB 522, Labor Relations and Collective Bargaining in Public Sector. So anytime you need to reach me, you can reach me through my email address. Also, if you have access to making a phone call, you're welcome to call me at this number. However, I can be reached through email on a regular basis. So the course description gives you an idea of what is expected in this course overall. Also, the course description in learning objectives or exit competencies usually tells you what's important for the final exam. So for example, at the end of this course, you should understand the concept of labor relation and collective bargaining agreement. You should be able to develop certain skills with regards to contract negotiations. You should also know something about understanding developing proper relation in management unions and their organizational structure. Institute sound policies and schemes for employees' benefits to create harmony and good industrial relationships. And finally, be able to implement collective bargaining agreements, grievance procedures, and arbitration processes that are particularly comprehensively and well presented. So these are some of the main uh, exit competencies you should be aware of in the days to come as you're reading the textbook. This is your main textbook by Michael Carroll and Christina Hevron. So it's a 2013 textbook, which is very, very good. It has a lot of good topics that you should be very interested in because they're applicable in all work sectors and all disciplines. And if your uh, file or printed book uh, does not look very good sometimes, or if you don't have it with you, you're always welcome to go and see an electronic version of it here, page by page. However, sometimes because of internet connectivity, it might be slow to get to each of these pages to see them online. So here on this page, you can see what is the requirement for your reading. So I'm asking you to read them in a chronological order from chapter one all the way to chapter 13. Of course, as you can see, some of the material is basically US based. So they relate to US laws, which may not necessarily be applicable to everyone in Afghanistan. 
uh, but nonetheless, they are important for you to understand to see how American laws uh, got created and how they got here over the last 150 years to where they are now today. So, and then you see chapter five and six, negotiation model strategies and tactics, negotiation, neg negotiating a collective bargaining agreement, wage and salary issues. All of these are things that you and I see on a day-to-day -day basis, both in private and public sectors. So they're a good review for you. In terms of your assignments, what you need to do in this class, obviously participation. So if I give you some exercises, activities that you need to do in two days, three days, or in a synchronized chat or asynchronously, you should uh, do those in a timely way, in a qualitative way, and please follow directions as they're presenting to you. And then all of those activities, lectures, videos, your assignments, and your reading should prepare you for the midterm exam, which will cover basically uh, half of the chapters. And then the final exam is comprehensive, so it should cover all the chapters. So please read the first half of that book very carefully for the midterm exam so you can score well. And then also that will prepare you for the final exam uh, also because some of the questions may come back again in the final exam. So make sure you participate qualitatively in the activities assignments in even uh, case analysis that I give you individually or as groups to work on. Be prepared for the midterm exam. So for midterm exam, if we're able to take the exam in one classroom, then I might uh, give you different case analysis or objective questions of true and false multiple choice and so on to work on. On the other hand, if we're not able to get together as in one class for a live exam, then we might have to go with what I have written here or an alternative case analysis uh, that I would email to you or give to you during the middle of uh, the class. We do have a group analysis. So in this case, you will be divided into groups of about four to five people and you'll determine what kind of topic or problem you would like to work on. So my recommendation is follow the introduction, overview of the topic, literature research, analysis, recommendation, summary, and references. This is a typical graduate level paper that you all should be working on. So in this case, if you have, let's say, five people on your team, each of you should be focused on writing about four to five pages per person. So if you have five people, that means you'll be writing about 20 to 25 pages as a team. But obviously make sure that your final paper is written with one voice. So a person should be editing the final paper and all of you should review the final paper for your input and final edits. I have suggested some rubrics for you here. So hopefully these rubrics can be a guide for you, but they're not absolute. So again, your papers, anything that you submit, these are graduate level quality. That means they should be of publishable quality, just like journal articles that are written and published in internationally ranked journals. On this final page of your syllabus, I do have a short biography and philosophy statement for you, where I discuss some of the best management philosophies that have been helpful to me as a manager in the corporate arena to deal with my employees and to create an atmosphere where I thought they would be the most productive and the happiest. Finally, I've given you a short virtual resume of myself, so if you want to see online, you can click on this link here, and then that gives you a four to five minute biography of myself online. And if you want to know a little bit about my leadership philosophy, here's a short video on YouTube. You can click on it and see that as well. As always, you can reach me through my email, and I look forward to working with you in this class. Stay healthy, do well in the class, and have fun. So as you've already seen by reviewing the course material, the PowerPoints and the book chapter, hopefully you already have a good idea of what we talk about when it comes to labor relations and more specifically about your relationship with your employees, the, the unions, the government and other stakeholders in the area. So labor relation is the term which generally refers to the process between managers in a representative of employees which could be a union. So that union is representing uh, one or more employees jointly with one voice in a way. 
So again, in this case, labor relation is a term which generally refers to the process between management and a representative of employees, otherwise known as a union, that's utilized to make decisions in the workplace. What do we mean by collective bargaining agreements or CBA? So collective bargaining agreement is a written and signed document between an employer entity in some sort of a labor organization which specifies the terms and conditions of employment. So collective bargaining in the private sector is the process by which union leaders representing groups of employees negotiate specific terms of employment with designated representatives of management. Collective bargaining is defined as the continuous relationship between an employer and a designated labor organization, which is representing a specific unit of employees for the purpose of negotiating written terms of employment. Again, that could be for a specified period of time, given one year, five year, three year, 10 year, or whatever is negotiated between the union organization and the employer, the institution, or the government um, branch. Terms of employment negotiated generally include the price of labor for workers. For example, the wages and benefits, work rules, including hours of work, job classification, effort required in work practices, individual job rights, such as seniority, the discipline procedures in promotions and layoff procedures, as well as management and union rights. And it can also include methods of enforcement and administration of the contract, which can include the grievance resolution process. So why do we study labor relations? Well, if you work in the public sector, there's a very, very good chance that you will have labor union workers. So either your colleagues will be in the union or you will be in the union or at least one of the departments might be members of the union. So nonetheless, labor activities might affect you in some capacity, such as an airline strike or a teacher strike. And you have brothers and sisters or young children going to that school and the teachers are on strike because of some dispute between them and the organization, so it's gonna have an impact on you. Labor unions spearheaded many, many of the rights in the workplace, which is enjoyed by all employees in all countries throughout the world. More specifically, I can relate to the ones here in the United States. So labor organization means any employee committee or other organization of any kind in which employees deal with employers concerning grievances, labor disputes, wages, hours, or even the hours that they will be working. So what are some of the pros and cons of union membership? Why would somebody want to join unions or be against unions? First of all, uh, union members support their union for higher wages, representation and discipline in discharge cases, they want greater job security, better health care, pension uh, for their retirement, and paid time off benefits. Some members complain of union dues, which seems to be high sometimes on a monthly or annual basis, and they complain about less possibility of individual rewards based on performance. Because remember, the union's job is to represent all employees. So they're not necessarily representing you or one of your colleagues alone, but the collective department or employees who are members of this specific union. Second, management and owners find value in unionization for its grievance handling, fewer individual requests and complaints, and reducing friction at the workplace with standardized rules. Some people complain of higher personnel costs that reduce a company's competitive position they become less flexible in terms of their work rules and also greater time spent on grievances in a less competitiveness in the global market. Third, there's some benefit of unionization to the society in general. 
Why? Because there's an increase in the size of the middle class because of the living wages that employees get. So more money basically means workers are spending that money in society or in the cities where they live, and the society benefits from more jobs for more workers. And society also benefits because unions have taken a leadership position in passing on more employment laws that are beneficial for all workers in any workplace. In other words, workers have a collective voice and they're able to basically have a better work environment for not just themselves, but for future employees who come after them in the organization, as well as other employment places. Finally, we should also mention that there is uh, a downside. So much of the society finds that unionization makes firms less competitive in global markets. Also, some people do not like the image of union leaders and believe unionization is less relevant in today's marketplace. So why do people join union? Number one is security. Employees want protection from unfair and sometimes arbitrary decisions that are made by management in different times. For example, during this coronavirus period, many small businesses have laid off their employees immediately in the state of Florida here where I live. So the same thing has happened obviously all over the world where when times are tough economically, managers and owners tend to lay off some of their employees almost immediately. Overall, in cases of layoffs, if they must happen, then they expect seniority to be followed. In other words, people who came last should be laid off first. And in cases that involve discipline and discharge, employees expect the union to provide them with some experienced advice or lawyers who can tell them what to sign and how to leave the organization. Employees expect good wages and benefits. This is a bread and butter issue for many workers and almost all organizations. They expect contract negotiations to provide them with better wages and better than their non-union counterparts, at least by a difference that exceeds their union dues. So what does that mean? That means if I'm a member of the union and you're not, therefore I should be making a little bit more money because I pay monthly dues to the union to represent me. So there should be some tangible benefit for me. Workers also want good working conditions. They expect the union to protect them by negotiating for a safe and healthy work environment in all cases, winter, summer, tough times, good times. We want to be in a workplace that is safe for all. And workers want fair and just management practices. Workers expect that the grievance and disciplinary process negotiated by the union in the collective bargaining agreement or CBA will provide them protection against biased or even unreasonable managers. Most collective bargaining agreements require the just cause standard in disciplinary cases, which is basically a basic principle that is followed by arbitrators and judges in courts all over the world. Just cause. Workers want to belong. A strong need in many individuals is the need to belong to a larger group that shares their values and concerns. A union often gives employees a mechanism for bringing them together in creating a social network. Employees want a collective voice. A basic principle of unionization is strength in numbers. So therefore, the individual employee believes he or she has a more powerful voice when dealing with their managers in senior officers at the institution or at the organization. Why do we study human resource management? Uh, we study human resource management to help ensure that you get results through your people every single day. We cannot become a powerful manager. We cannot become a powerful organization without people. 
So human resources about the study of people in working with people and working through people to get the results that you and your organizations need. There are many great managers out there that have been very successful because they had a knack for hiring the right people in the right departments for the right jobs and in motivating them, appraising them and continuously developing them to do better and better on a regular basis. That's the type of manager you want to be and that's why we study human resources management. Human resource management is the process of acquiring, training, appraising, and compensating employees, as well as attending to their labor relations issues, while also taking care of their health and safety and other fairness concerns. That is human resources management. That's why we're studying in this course about labor relations in collective bargaining agreements. Strategic human resources management is about formulating and executing resource policies and practices that produce the employee competencies and behaviors that the company needs to achieve its strategic aims over the coming two years, three years, five years, and 10 years into the future. The more you're prepared about employee relations and collective bargaining agreements, the more likely you will strategically drive your organization Okay, so now let's start with chapter one in your textbook. So chapter one of the textbook is entitled Introduction to Labor Relations. The agenda in outline for chapter one is to understand labor, understand relations and why we study it. Labor union today is pros and cons, why people join unions in union membership, opportunities for growth, labor management cooperation, types of unions, and the National Labor Board, which is obviously an American organization. So what is labor relations and why we study it? Labor relations is an activity between management and unions or employees concerning the negotiation or implementation of a collective bargaining agreement. What is collective bargaining agreement? Collective bargaining agreement is a written and signed document between an employer entity and a labor organization which specifies the terms and conditions of employment for a specific period of time. So again, this is an agreement between the employees and employer through a medium called unions. So unions are also known as labor organization. So labor organization or union is an employee, committee, or organization of any kind in which employees deal with employers concerning grievances, labor disputes, wages, hours, or even working conditions. Some of the major American employee rights laws are mentioned in your textbook. I believe you should become somewhat familiar with these laws because some of them are universal laws that all governments tend to have, and you can compare to see which of these apply to the laws in Afghanistan. For, for example, Americans have the Equal Pay Act, which began in 1963, which requires equal pay for equal work in the same workplace regardless of a person's gender, and it makes it unlawful to retaliate against a person who complains about pay discrimination or participates in a lawsuit. In 1964, you see the Civil Rights Act, Title VII, which makes it illegal to discriminate against someone on the basis of his or her race, skin color, religion, national origin, or sex or gender, and is illegal to retaliate against a person who complains about discrimination and participates in a lawsuit. It also requires employers to reasonably accommodate sincere held religious practices, except in cases of undue hardship. In 1965, there was the Affirmative Action or Equal Employment Opportunity Law. So you see the Executive Order 11246 regarding Affirmative Action. 
This relates more to federal contractors and subcontractors. In other words, those companies that are working with the U.S. government. Affirmative action must be taken by covered employers to recruit and advance qualified minorities, women, persons with disabilities, and veterans. So I'm not going to go through all of these laws, but you should read them closely because they relate to your workplace and your employees, your colleagues, and perhaps yourself today or in the future. For example, we have the Age Discrimination in Employment Act, although in 1967 this was enacted. So once a person reaches the age of 40, he or she is considered an older worker. An older worker is protected. In other words, you cannot fire somebody or choose not to hire them simply because of their age, because that would be age discrimination. In 1978, you see the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. In 1988, the Employee Polygraph Protection Act. 1990, Older Worker Benefits Protection Act. 1990, Americans with Disabilities Act. So all these laws should be studied and compared with Afghanistan laws. If we do have laws that are similar, that's good. If not, what can we do to maybe make some adjustments that are appropriate for our culture in Afghanistan? So we need to learn not only the American laws, the Canadian laws, the European laws, but we need to look at which ones perhaps we can even adjust and then adapt to our local customs and cultural norms in Afghanistan. Your textbook also mentions that union membership has pros and cons. In other words, positives and negatives. So what are some of the positives and what are some of the negatives for those who are members of the unions? and for managers and owners, and for society in general. So as you can see here, your textbook mentions that there are many positives or pros for those who become members of the union. For example, they get higher wages, they get representation and discipline and discharge cases, there's greater job security for them, and also there's better health care, pension plans, and even paid time off benefits. So these members do pay union dues. However, they hopefully benefit more because of the collective representation. The negative for membership is that they are those union dues. So they have to pay a fee on a regular basis. Also, there are fewer individual rewards based on performance. In terms of some of the positives for managers and the owners of organizations, there's a better system for grievance handling. When so so when the employees are not doing their jobs well, the grievance system is already in place. There's fewer individual requests and complaints, and also there are standard rules for reducing friction in the workplace. However, the negatives are that higher personnel costs reduce competitive position, there's less flexible work rules, also greater time spent on grievances, and less competitive global position. In terms of society, there's increased middle class and leadership in passing major employment laws. So the society's positives are that people are making more money as a result of their membership within the union. So when employees and workers make more money, they spend that money in the society. Therefore, society benefits from selling more products creating more jobs in the community, and obviously there's more tax money to benefit everybody in the community. Also for society, there has been that leadership of unions which has caused major employment laws that have been passed and agreed upon between workers in organizations, and many of those have become employment laws as stated by the governments. And sometimes some union leaders are seen as being too violent because they encourage their employees to protest and go on strike. And therefore, some of the people in the community and society cannot get to work if all the drivers and transportation professionals are on strike. So that creates a bit of a hassle. So there is some negative that's associated with society as well when things do not go well. 
So why do employees join unions for job security to earn more money, get better benefits, have more fair working conditions, to have a fair and just supervision or management and need to belong to a group of people who have a similar voice? And also this collective voice gets them more power. Some of the soft issues that lead employees to unionize include getting recognition, protection from humiliation, Unfortunately, sometimes there's too much bullying from coworkers or in many cases from supervisors. Some of this leads to harassment behaviors. So employees want to be protected from that through union membership. Sometimes there's hopelessness in terms of where am I going? What am I doing here in this organization if I'm not going to make more money and not get more benefits for retirement? Sometimes there are double standards for older workers versus younger workers, for men versus women, for, for women versus men, or maybe older and younger individuals. There's lack of control on the part of the employees in terms of making their jobs a little bit better for themselves. Job insecurity, broken promises by managers and owners and stockholders, and also, obviously, people join union to have a person representing them. Let's talk a little bit about capitalism and collective bargaining. The freedom to enter into contracts to decide the use of your economic resources, such as the capital, as well as labor, are essential concepts in capitalism. Employers are free to seek employees and offer them economic resources as exchange for their work or their labor. Also, employees are free to enter into contracts or not for their labor. In the state of Florida, for example, we have the at-will employment laws, which means an employee can choose to quit his or her job at any time from an organization. On the other side, the employer can fire or terminate an employee's work at any time for any reason or no reason whatsoever, unless there's a specific contract between the employee and the employer, then they have to obviously abide by that. As you're reading the history of union membership over the last uh, 100 years or so in the United States, so let's look at this chart from 1930s all the way to 2010. So that covers about 80 years of history. When it comes to the trends, as you're reading the chapter and also other articles about union membership in the United States over the last 80 to 90 years, actually there has been a huge decline over the years. However, when we look at the years 2008 and 2009, we tend to see a little bit of rise in union membership because that's when the United States experienced a huge economic recession and therefore people wanted to be more secure so more and more employees join unions so they can be represented collectively by that union. Let's talk a little bit about the Employee Free Choice Act. This act requires the National Labor Relations Board to certify a union to represent workers if a majority signs cars that authorize the union. There are opportunities for growth in union membership for the U.S. So there's the strategic industry focus. The strategic industry focus means the new union federation of change to win aims to build membership in union strength by focusing on a few strategic industries like hospitality, healthcare, airline, casino industry, shipping industry, professional workers, immigrant workers for the U.S. Are there opportunities for employees to organize in Afghanistan, both in Kabul as well as other states outside of Kabul? Private sector as well as public sector. There has been labor management cooperation trends in various forms. For example, we have the voluntary recognition of the unions, performance-based incentive systems, employee teams, quality of work life programs, federal government being involved here, and also integrative collective bargaining. So in chapter one, you'll see the acronym GMNUMMI. What does this mean? The new United Motor Manufacturing, Inc. is a unique international joint effort between General Motors 
in Toyota in the United Automobile Workers or UAW. Think about how successful Toyota has been over the years. How did the Japanese management change one of the least productive American auto plants into one of the finest? They did it through cooperation between labor and management. They created fewer job classifications. They created fewer supervisors. In other words, there was a flatter hierarchy as opposed to many, many layers of managers in any department or workplace. They also created work teams. So they were more empowered to change what they did not like or what didn't work for them in a specific department or position. What are the different types of unions? Your textbook mentions that you have craft unions, industrial unions, unions in the entertainment business and professional sports, transportation union and railroad and airline industries, and unions of agricultural workers. So what is the NLRB that we've been talking about? So this refers to the National Labor Relations Board, which oversees most labor relation activities in the private sector, and it was created by the 1935 National Labor Relations Act in the United States. The purpose of the National Labor Relations Act was to minimize some of the industrial strife, which was actually interfering with the normal flow of commerce in the United States. So the government wants things to flow smoothly, go smoother, so therefore they have to intervene and create these acts to help laborers, unions, and management or owners. The act lists employer activities that are considered unfair labor practices, which could be in violation of certain employee rights. For example, interfering with employees' rights in general, interfering with the formation or administration of a union, discriminating against union members in the workplace, or refusing to bargain with employees' representatives within that union. So all of these are some of the activities that are considered to be unfair labor practices, and obviously they would be in violation of National Labor Relations Board. The National Labor Relations Board is a five-member body appointed for five-year term by the President of the United States with the advice and consent of the U.S. Senate. The National Labor Relations Board has jurisdiction or authority or power and control and influence over persons when there's a labor dispute affecting commerce or when there's a controversy involving an employer, employee, or a labor organization. I already mentioned what the NLRB's jurisdiction is. So there has to be a test which must be met before the board is empowered to act. In other words, there must be persons involved, there should be a labor dispute, and there should be some sort of a negative impact on commerce. Employees should be represented, there should be an employer or employers, in some sort of a union or labor organization. So if these are present, then the NLRB is likely to act. Preemption is a legal theory in which the American federal law takes precedent over state law. So as an exercise, you and your teammates in your group, I would like for you to think about why people join unions. And one of the main reasons is that they're not happy with their workplace, they're not happy with their salary, they're not happy with their bosses or managers or the way the managers behave toward them. So therefore, they would like to join together and be represented by a union. That also means that they will have to pay additional fees to that union in order for the union to represent them. So if that is the case, that those are some of the reasons that they're joining the union, my question to you is which of the following can be improved or enhanced in one modern organization in Afghanistan today? That could be again a public sector or a private sector organization that's fairly large with large number of employees in order to prevent employees perhaps from joining the union. What would be the benefits of collective bargaining agreement for the employees in the organization?
let's review some typical questions. For example, what type of questions you should know as you're reading these chapters? So let me provide you a sample of possible questions that may come up on final exam. So you should be able to answer it with a good level of detail at the graduate level of quality uh, for essay type questions. What do you believe are the major pros and cons of unions today? Well, some of the pros are that unions provide higher wages, representation and discipline and discharge cases, greater job security, better health care, pension, and they offer paid time off benefits, as well as grievance handling, fewer individual requests and complaints reducing friction at the workplace with standardized rules, and they help increase the size of the middle class by providing a living wage, and they take a leadership role in passing on new and better and fairer and ethical employment laws throughout the world. What are some cons or the negative aspects of unions? Well, first of all, it would be the union dues. So if you have to pay a certain amount of money every single month or every single year from your wages, so that basically is not a good thing if they're not giving you additional benefits. So union dues are a negative, and there's less possibility of individual rewards based on performance. There's higher personnel costs that reduce a company's overall competitive position in the marketplace or in the region. What do the term collective bargaining agreement in contract really mean or refer to when it comes to labor relations? Collective bargaining is a continuous process between the employer and a designated labor union that includes negotiating and administering a contract. Contracts are the agreement reached by the parties for the members and includes terms of employment, wages, work rules, hours of work, satisfaction with the job, and methods of enforcement and administration of contract grievance resolution. The year 2009 for the Americans in the United States was a very significant year in the trends of union membership. Why is this? Do you believe that this event will reverse itself? Why or why not? In 2009, most of the union members were government workers compared to the private sector workers, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. The blue collar worker is no longer the real stereotype for unions. The steady rise in public sector union membership, which was combined with a sharp decline in private sector union membership due to the Great Recession of 2008, caused the historical event years earlier than forecasted. As a matter of fact, substantial losses in manufacturing and construction jobs accounted for a great percentage of the private sector decline in recent years for the U.S. Another trend in union membership is the rise in female union membership, which has made great gains on male union membership percentages. Males suffered a much larger decline in overall union membership compared to females uh, over the past uh, couple of decades, at least in the United States. So these trends will probably not reverse because manufacturing continues to be outsourced to foreign countries where labor seems to be a little bit cheaper. And the opportunity for union membership growth is in the service industry, which employs a lot of females. Also, union membership in the public sector might decline in the years to come due to the high costs associated with the public sector. Which US industry do you believe is likely to grow in union membership in the next 10 to 20 years and why. Some believe that the healthcare industry is likely to see a growth in union membership in the United States due to some of the changes facing the industry with new federal government health laws. Also, employers are driving employees to unions by providing low take-home pay and turning away from employee demands for better working conditions and patient care as well as less overtime that's being offered for the healthcare 
employees. However, unions are using more sophisticated organizing methods, including home visits, professionally produced advertising, using modern technologies in DVDs in salts. Also, most importantly, sometimes managers and supervisors forget that they are really the key to union membership of employees. If employees are dissatisfied, they feel as though they're being treated unfairly or unethically or even illegally in some cases, they're likely to be tempted to organize and they welcome union to represent them. However, if employees are treated fairly, they feel good with their management, and the relationship is solid and employees are happy, why would they vote for unionization? They can go and talk to their managers as opposed to having an outside or a third party representing them. So when you're a manager, think about that. Are you doing your part to treat your employees fairly? If you are good, if you're not, then your employees deserve to have a union representing them. So in general, how do jobs in craft unions differ from those in industrial unions? Craft unions represent workers in a particular skill or occupation, such as, for example, carpenters, plumbers, electricians. In industrial union, workers include semi-skilled and unskilled workers in a particular plant or facility. Oftentimes my students ask, do unions strive to create restrictive work rules? In other words, can management live with heavy restrictions in today's highly competitive work environment? There is a legal restriction regarding feather bedding that we can talk about a little bit and reflect upon. Feather bedding is a concept that describes the process of a labor union team requiring managers and organizations to hire more workers than is really necessary to perform a particular job or a task in a department. So they just want to have additional workers to be paid and hopefully become members of unions. That's what feather bidding basically is. So do managers ever take long lunches, socialize, or even knock off early? Have managers ever been criticized for basically taking long lunches with their friends and colleagues and leaving early? Are managers immune from what the workers and their unions are being criticized for? As you know, Frederick W. Taylor in his scientific management colleagues and associates pioneered breaking down the elements of the jobs. They sought out the one best way in terms of an exact set of efficient motions for each job. Some craft unions resisted having the jobs they dealt with broken down into pieces to be studied or restructured. Restrictive work rules, such as the ones we mentioned during the scientific management era, grew out of craft unions attempting to retain their skills. Restrictive work rules also grew out of the institutionalization of the specialization created by scientific management. However, in recent years, there have been a loosening of work rules and various job descriptions have been abandoned in favor of fewer job titles that are much broader in nature. Do unions focus so much on raising wages that the leaders lose sight of job losses that are caused by increased labor costs? Well, when demand is expanding as it was uh, over the course of the 1950s and 1960s in the United States, a person did not feel the trade-off between rising wages and lost jobs, uh, at least not very strongly. However, as demand growth slowed, came to halt or even shrank, an adjustment had to be made to save jobs. So there is a concern there. Many people question in the late 1970s and 1980s whether the situation in industries such as the automotive industry was in a temporary fluctuation or a long-term change. Some of my students tend to work in white-collar jobs. 
So why should they bother learning about unions? That's another typical question that I receive. But the workers in unions are people like you and me. Many of the topics are very, very interesting and broadly applicable to almost all professions in terms of our discipline and also negotiation skills that you might need in any organization. So if a person wants to avoid unions like managers and owners, then it's important that you and I understand unionization and collective bargaining agreements. Unions are a significant part of our work environment today. So if you want to operate in this global and competitive work environment in terms of business, the stock market, the politics, and the costs, and the trade, and so on, you should know a lot about unionization and the negotiation skills that you'll use to basically get a good deal for employees as well as for the employers through this medium called unions in the middle. Good luck.